this video, I'm going to be building an awesome 4K gaming PC build. With one of the most exciting GPU designs released at CES earlier this year, a boatload of high-end hardware, and some components that not only look the part, but perform really well too. If you're looking to build a system for super high fidelity gaming, it doesn't get much better than this. The NZXT H6 PC case lineup offers an innovative, compact, dual chamber mid tower for those looking to find great aesthetics and top tier airflow. The H6 Flow's design prioritizes GPU cooling and frees up space, while the large, expansive panoramic glass showcases the inside of your build. Available in white or black, with or without RGB fans, the H6 Flow has an option for everyone. Learn more at the review in the card section now, or buy one for yourself at the first link in the description below. Let me begin with the elephant in the room. It is of course the expert 4080 super now to say that this card has had a mixed reception would be an understatement some people absolutely love it and some people really can't stand it it certainly isn't going to be for everyone but what i like about it is that it's different now it does share some design cues from other cards on the market it's still large it's still a triple slot form factor and the one fan at the bottom left with the other fan bin at the top right can hardly stop you from thinking about the founders edition design similarly this color scheme is like the non-super variants as far as the shade of metallic silver goes. But what it does do is look a bit more exciting than the founder's designs. You get these nice silver or chrome accents at the front. You get this really, really nice machine feel. I have to say in person, parts of the card feel more plastic than perhaps I would have liked, but it doesn't feel poorly built. And it is nice to see a brand do something a little bit different rather than a three fan, three slot black card where everything's the same and you might even get a tinge of RGB at the top. So that's the 4080 Super Expert. Obviously, as we saw from the 4080 Super launch, it's an okay card for 4K gaming. You've not really got a great deal of other options. The 4090 is obviously way too expensive for a build like this and for most normal people, while AMD's 7900 XTX remains probably its closest rival. Personally, and I said this in our recent roundup of the best GPUs to buy this year, I'd rather the 4080 Super than a 7900 XTX just because of that better ray tracing in DLSS. Yes, it won't be for everyone, but given the rasterization performance is so similar, I think the 4080 Super makes a little bit more sense. Now, of course, for a high-end GPU, we need a high-end CPU you too, and that's where the i7-14700K comes in. Again, when it comes to CPUs, the market's a little bit weird. Intel's 14th gen hardly set the world on fire, though the processors are pretty hot. But what it does do is provide great gaming and multi-threaded performance. If you're looking to do a bit of video editing, a bit of streaming, it has you covered. AMD's core counts by comparison are a little bit on the low side, though it's certainly worth bearing in mind that not all cores are created equal. This chip's got a number of E cores, which stand for efficiency cores. They're lower power, but take a lot of the load away from those high power P cores, which we'll be using for gaming. It really is quite clever. It just means that a 10 core Intel chip and a 10 core AMD chip don't quite mean the same thing. Now, obviously for our 14th gen processor, we need a 14th gen compatible motherboard. Just keep an eye out and see which ones have got that BIOS update specifically made for Intel 14th gen. This one is the Tomahawk Max Wi-Fi, and as well as supporting 14th gen out of the box, you also get Wi-Fi 7 support on board as standard. And given this is actually cheaper than a lot of the Z7, 90 designs that have been around for longer, this is kind of a no-brainer. As well as that Wi-Fi 7 support, we've also got DDR5 memory support, we've got room for Gen 5 NVMe drives and Gen 5 graphics cards in future. Now this board does have a few like neon green accents, which I think we're going to lead into. Deepcool's Morpheus case, which I'll be taking a look at in a bit more detail later, also has some turquoisey greeny kind of accents. So I'm hoping the whole thing might tie in quite nicely. Pop the CPU into the socket, you guys know how to do this, and then return the socket cover back into place. As far as memory goes, I've picked up 32 gigabytes of A-Pacer's Panther. I hadn't really seen too much of this memory around, then we did a video with it before Christmas, and I quite liked it. For a build like this where we don't want to go fully into the black design, a bit of silver here and there, a kit like this is going to work really well. It matches up nicely with the cooler too, helping to create a more cohesive build aesthetic. This kit is a fairly low latency kit as well, with a speed of 6,000 megahertz. It's ticking a lot of boxes for us, giving us low latency and relatively fast speeds 
for accelerated gaming performance. I will go ahead though and link this RAM alongside all the other components below for latest pricing and availability. While we're here, I think the SSD makes a lot of sense next up. And this is another brand new component to take a look at. This is the Corsair MP600 Elite with heatsink. This particular model is a two terabyte drive with reads of seven gigs and writes of up to six and a half gigs. So it's basically on the top end of Gen 4. This particular drive has the heatsink on already. Some will come without and allow you to retain the built-in heat sinks or heat spreaders on the motherboard. The drive is just going to slide in nice and easily. It's still a toolless installation and go in without too many problems. That brings me nicely on to the CPU cooler. Now this is another new product from Deep Cooler. Typically Deep Cooler more of an entrant within our mid-range and budget builds but this new Mystique 360 is their first cooler with a screen at least as far as I know. So I'm quite excited to see how this Mystique design stacks up. Credit where credit's due that feels quite nice. In fact that feels really nice. Now is it removable? Uh no it's not but there is a bit of RGB on there as well and the fans come pre-mounted to the radiator and look at the cable management as well. That is really really fantastic to see. Now obviously this isn't particularly useful if you're going to mount the radiator at the front of a case but I think we'll be going at the top so that's going to make our life really quite easy and the screen's actually fairly high resolution about 640 by 480 meaning we should be able to display some quite decent quality stuff given how small the screen itself is. Now the reason I got the uh, cooler out was actually to look at the mounting hardware and see if there was any preparation needed for our Intel motherboard and by the looks of things there is. Now the first stage of that is to take the included back plate. This is going to pop through the rear of the motherboard a little something like so and that's going to give us four silver posts on which we can use to mount the cooler. Add these included stoppers into place to stop the posts from going anywhere and the rest of the cooler installation will be completed in a few moments after we've moved this into the case. Doing this now just makes everything way easier. Trust me. And talking of which, it's a bit of a beast. This is incredibly heavy, 15 kilograms for anyone who's interested. And it's the Deep Cool Morpheus. Now, continuing the theme with giving Deep Cool a go when it comes to high end components, this is another example. Now, I can't seem to, there we go, get the top panel off. But with a large tempered glass side panel, ugh, a mesh front panel as well, and then a large rear metal perforated back. Back. <laughs> that if you're not careful, it's quite painful. What's quite interesting about this is that it's hyper-modular, hyper-customizable, and is certainly not for the faint-hearted. It's got 340 mil fans included as standard on the side. What's kind of weird is that these are in an exhaust configuration, which I don't really understand from an airflow point of view, but anyway, the motherboard tray is movable, so you can turn this into a dual chamber case if you like. The whole thing is kind of a bit crazy. And to be honest with you, one of the most complicated chassis I've actually ever used. Now you do get a screen here for your CPU use usage, GPU usage, and then the temperatures as well for both. That I believe can be customized via Deepcool software. We'll look at that a bit later. Integrated GPU support bracket is another feature. A little bit of a flimsy, lightweight device, but we don't need anything too advanced. And other than that, that's kind of it. The only really slightly weird thing about it is this box, which is a second PSU mount. Now it is totally removable and adjustable on these front rails. Presumably this is for the modularity. You can read a full review where we talk more about the various configs this case could hold in the card section now and at the first links down below. The good news is that all of the ATX standoff positions are pre-mounted and pre-installed. All that I need to do is just align the motherboard up, get that slotted in and screw it into place. You get obviously the nine screws you need to secure this down included in the box. By default, the rails at the front of the case are set up for 140 mil fans. I'm going to put the rad at the top of the chassis. So I need to narrow these down to 120s just so we can put some regular 120 mil fans up front. I might be being a bit ambitious, but it looked to me like this might support four or 120s. It is a big case, so it doesn't hurt to give it a try. There we go. One, two, three. Is the fourth one going to fit? Oh, I think it's a bit too long. Maybe. I'm going to give this a go and I'll report back to you in a few moments. This is definitely not the officially supported way, but I will say it does kind of work. And even those top and bottom fans, which aren't as secure as I would like, are completely fine. Maybe go for three 140s though, rather than four 120s if you're building this yourself. Now while I'm here, also going to add the radiator at the top and get the water block mounted. No RGB fans on this, but they're quite high quality. So I am going to leave them on. We should have plenty of lighting in the build elsewhere to make up for it. With all that sorted out, it's time for the GPU. And I couldn't 
do this normally, I've picked up a vertical GPU mount to add a little bit of flair. Now, this NZXT mount fits in any case, and we've got a Gen 4 riser cable as well, which is going to, of course, enable our 4080 Super to hog up to the rest of the build. And then I can go ahead, and I'm really excited about this, and put in the 4080 Super. Now, obviously, 4080 Super, talked about it earlier, great card for 4K, going to be more than good enough for playing all the latest AAA titles at really high visual fidelity and high settings for good measure. Sliding this in should be pretty simple, just a case of lining it up with the PCI slot, getting it nice and snug and clicking it into place. A couple of screws go just at the top of the graphics card to stop it going anywhere, but it matches the CPU cooler really, really well with the gray accents and the memory ties in quite nicely too. This is all turning out even better than I'd expected. The final part on the list is the power supply and I've picked up Deepcool's PX850G. Now, if you're gonna go for an i9 as an example, rather than the i7, and if you wanna knock up to a 4090, definitely consider a 1000 watt unit. But trust me, this will be fine for the build as it stands. The boxes comprise the two sections. We get all the cables in our nice cardboard box just here, and then the power supply itself, which is fairly compact and has the PCI Gen 5 12 volt power cable clearly marked, which is great to see. As far as power cables go, these are quite nice black rubber sleeved units in the included bag. But for a high-end build like this, I wouldn't say they're all exactly quite as premium as what we could have. And that's where these come in. These are some easy DIY fab cable extensions. They look absolutely amazing. Loads of colors available. Just pick these up off Amazon. They weren't particularly expensive and I'll link them down at the affiliate links in the description below. Get all your modular cables plugged up, including of course, that GPU power cable. No extension for this. I want to stick with that base included Gen 5 power adapter and get everything wired up. CPU to the top left, motherboard to the right hand side, and then any fan and front panel cables afterwards. With a bit of luck then, the whole thing should boot up. In order to test this theory, I'm gonna go ahead and take a kettle lead. I haven't wired up the JFP1 cables yet. So let me boot this manually with a screwdriver. Oh, there we go. Yep, it's on. We're, we've, we've got power. Fans at the front are on and spinning. Fan at the back is on and spinning. RGB's looking good. But there's still a few things that are definitely not working. The first of those is the fans at the top. So that's my next job. It looks like all I was missing was one fan connector for our 120 mils on the radiator at the top, and then a fan and SATA power cable for the RGB pre-installed 140s on the side. It even looks like the screen's turned on, which is amazing. We can configure this in software later. For now though, let's see how good this looks when it's actually finished and ready to go and of course a geek up montage and i'll rejoin you in just a few moments for those all-important gaming benchmarks Moving through into performance, and it's time to see how well a super high-end build like this really does when it comes to the latest AAA titles. The first game that we tested was Modern Warfare 3 at that 4K high preset. We did use DLSS at quality just to give, of course, that frame rate a little bit of a boost. DLSS is so good on those NVIDIA GPUs that it does make sense to leverage it, at least at the quality preset. Here, the build achieved 141 FPS on average, with decent 90 and 99th percentile results too, in the region of 136 and 124 frames per second. Starfield at 4K high carried on this trend of great results. 78 frames per second was the average we were able to achieve. Now this obviously isn't anywhere near as good as Modern Warfare 3, but compared to our other results in Starfield, it sits at the top end of that graph. Starfield is still a really hard and in many ways poorly optimized game to run, so to see a frame rate even this high is still fairly impressive. Hogwarts Legacy at 4K did slightly better. Here we got 80 frames per second on average. Again, not as good as the triple digit frame rates you'll find in the likes of Warzone 3, but given this is an RPG game with less importance and emphasis on frame rate, it's still pretty good. Fortnite at 1080p, just for a bit of a laugh really, competitive settings delivered a astonishingly high frame rate. We're in the hundreds of FPS here with 323 FPS on average, and it's a game that you guys seemingly like to see tested over and over again. Apex Legends is a slightly more realistic barometer of FPS performance, both in terms of frame rate and first person shooters. 4K high in Apex delivered 176 FPS. So still very competitive, still gonna hold up very well on a system like this. Formula One 2023 is next up. 4K ultra high DLSS enabled and set to quality yielded a frame rate of about 170 FPS on average. This was tested using the game's inbuilt benchmarking mode too. Finally, to wrap things up, we tried a ray tracing title with a bit of DLSS 
SS3, and here we achieved an impressive frame rate of 132 FPS on average. While the 4080 Super is undoubtedly a little bit more expensive than its direct AMD competition, I do genuinely believe that having access to those extra features like DLSS and ray tracing is beneficial, and for a lot of buyers, will be worth the small price increase. What do you guys think though of this build, the 4080 Super, Deep Cool's new Morpheus case and cooler? Let me know down in the comments below. Get subscribed to see more from me. Thanks for watching, and as always, we'll see you in the next one.